Mr. Mike. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks also to our C-SPAN viewers who are joining us from all over the country and all over the world to talk about, to hear about, to listen to some dead ideas. Uh, this book is just to, let me just offer some bona fides. This is actually, I think, one of the most important books I've read in the last couple of years. Um, and one of the things that I think is remarkable about this book is not only the analysis that it provides, but it does so with a kind of, of, of clarity and, and gracefulness of writing that is essentially unmatched in the world of, of public policy. Um, I actually started off as a policy person. I ended up as a, as a speech writer. And one reason for that is that I just I couldn't stand reading this stuff because it was so <laughs> boring and poorly written. And this is actually probably the most clearly written, engaging policy book you will ever find. Um, and I want to start, Matt, by, by I, I think that your path is an interesting path. And I don't think that, that, that p someone who didn't take a path like yours, a kind of a non-traditional path, could have written this book. Um, so tell us about, just give us, narrate for us how you got here. Uh, you grew up in? Uh, in, uh, in the New York suburbs. Uh, and by the way, thank you, Dan, for doing this, and thanks to Politics and Prose. Uh, I did live around the corner uh, when I lived here, and so Politics and Prose was my bookstore, so it's, uh, it's great to be back. Um, uh, I, I grew up in New York suburbs. I studied economics as a, an undergraduate. My, if, if you really, my, my political sensibility, I guess, came, I always tell people I came by the third way a little honestly because my mother taught Head Start for eight years and my father was an entrepreneur, so I had kind of a business side and a social justice side and then studied economics, undergraduate, went to law school, so I'm a lapsed lawyer like, uh, like so many people. and. Uh, uh, ended up in management consulting in business and then came into government uh, where, uh, where I worked uh, first as a White House fellow but then for the Clinton White House in the budget office before descending into public policy writing for the New Republic and other magazines uh, some years ago. And you host a radio show. So you've done a number of different things. You've, you've seen this from the, the private sector working at McKinsey. Uh, you've seen this um, in the public sector <coughs> working at, at OMB. You've covered it as a journalist. Yes. You have you have the you brought to bear a lawyer's mind, um, which is not all good. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, they say that I actually they say you know law school sharpens your mind by narrowing it, um, it's and, true. and it's very true. Um, and so all the lawyers are nodding. Um, it also can kill your prose style, I think. And one of my proudest yeah. You know, one of the it's things I'm proudest of is to survive law school and still be able to write clearly. So, uh, Absolutely. I mean, for someone who survived both law school and OMB, the clarity of writing <laughs> is actually rather staggering. Um, so, but I, I think that that really, I, I, I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it really comes through in this book because, it's, because what this book does is calls into question conventional wisdom, but not conventional wisdom in the surface sense. Should we have a single-payer health care system? Should we have pay or play, whatever? But it calls into question conventional, conventional wisdom in a very, very deep sense. Because what you're saying in this book is that the sort of the, 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 the foundation of our public policies is um, our ideas that have passed their time. Give us an example of one of those and, and how it relates to the financial crisis. I guess, uh, you know, the, to me the whole idea of dead ideas is something that's uh, kind of eternal in human nature. Uh, it relates to this essential vulnerability that's uh, present in all of us. It's our psychology that it, it has to do with the slowness it, with which we adapt to the world and the way we think about the world even when the world radically changes. And you know, we've just been through in the last six months the implosion of the dead idea that financial markets can regulate themselves, right? If we had, uh, this would have been easy enough to unearth. There were people who were talking about this, you know, five or six years ago. And with just a very few changes that would have been considered smart, modest regulatory changes like adequate capital for banks or stopping the, uh, stopping, right, doesn't seem like rocket science, right? That you don't let the banks lever themselves up 30 or 40 to 1. Or if you stop the mortgage originators who were doing all these no down payment, you know, no, no proof of income loans, if they had to keep some skin in the game when they passed that through the system and securitized it, we could have avoided or mitigated a lot of what's happened. And so just like that dead idea could have been uncovered and, uh, and responded to in a way that would have saved us a lot of human pain and suffering today, 
I think that we're, uh, we won't get out of this mess and get ourselves back on a path toward durable prosperity unless we explode and get out front of the dead ideas in the book that I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, in, in some ways, I view this as a moment that's like uh, 1928. If you had asked people back then in 1928, should the federal government have a, a role in uh, assuring against uh, poverty and old age or in uh, helping people who lost their jobs be tidied over until, uh, until they got traction again in a new job or that the government should be involved in trying to uh, alleviate economic downturns in general. In 1928, most Americans would have said no. You know, we're a, we're a nation of rugged individualists. We, uh, we, uh, this should be a matter left to the family circle or to local private charities. But by 1940, those propositions were common sense. Mm -hmm. And I think now, in the same way, we're at the leading edge of a similar revolution in the way we think about a lot of our economic life, everything from uh, the role of the government, the role of corporations, taxes, trade, schools, health care, and uh, uh, we're about to go through, because of the pressure of this current crisis and the pressure of events from the globalization that we're seeing and the rapid technological change, the same fundamental change in a lot of the ways we think that are going to render a lot of these dead ideas truly obsolete. Let's talk about one of the ones that you, that you write about, which is one I um, makes me wince. Taxes hurt the economy, and they're always too high. Uh, now, when I, Mr. When I, Marx, respond. When, 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 I, when, I, when I had a, the, the, the fun chance to do the Colbert report the other night, you know, when Colbert goes, okay, what about this dead idea? Taxes hurt the economy and they're always too I said, taxes hurt the economy and they're always too high. He goes, right, what's the dead idea? <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, the, the reason I say that is, look, we're going to cut taxes in this current recession, obviously, to try and muscle through this. And we're not going to have, by the way, when I bring up 1928, we're not going to have a Great Depression or anything like that. We are throwing enough spaghetti against the wall, and we will uh, continue to throw enough spaghetti against the wall that we'll avoid that. We'll have a rough few years, but we'll avoid that. I'm not necessarily that. assured by that term. <laughs> All right, well, it, 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 Since I, you know this world much better than I do, the idea I, I, of Larry Summers with a big bowl of pasta going that whew, I, doesn't I, really... I, I believe in, yeah. in serious spaghetti throwing. Uh, so, um, but once we get through this recession, uh, there's no question that in the next decade, taxes will rise uh, as a share of the economy because we're going to retire the baby boom. And that means we're going to double the number of people on Social Security and Medicare. We already have $50 trillion in unfunded promises in those and related programs. And the math doesn't work uh, unless taxes go up somehow as a share of the economy. Now, the, the good news is the economy will be fine when this happens. Mm -hmm. And as I tell my conservative friends, this doesn't mean we're going to become France or Sweden. Now, I know some of my liberal friends say, wait, what do you mean? Why can't we become more like France or Sweden? But uh, the, the stuff we have to do, the taxes we'll need to raise to accommodate the baby boomers' retirement and to do some stuff for non-elderly Americans, which we should do, uh, will still leave us more of a rough, tough, cowboy, entrepreneurial American economy than, uh, than like some of the uh, much bigger social welfare states in Europe or Scandinavia. But this is undiscussable in our public life today because, uh, you know, the Republicans have ridden the tax issue for 30 years since Reagan. And even though privately they'll tell you, I quote in the book John McCain's top economic advisors from the, the campaign that just ended, saying that no matter who's in power, taxes will rise over the next decade. Uh, and, but, but the Democrats, you know, have to match the Republicans on tax cuts. And so there's a kind of conspiracy of silence on this in Washington, but the, the truth is, if we look at it right, it's an opportunity to actually do the taxing we have to do smarter. And to me, that means uh, lowering taxes on payrolls. You know, the payroll tax is this awful regressive job killing tax. We should cut that and we should raise taxes on things like dirty energy because we have a whole agenda we need to do to meet our, env our environmental goals and, and, and spur investment in clean energy. So this is, the good news is there are ways we can handle this that will boost American prosperity, but uh, first we're going to get have to get past this dead idea that uh, the taxes are always going to be going down or do that they hurt. Do you see a way to get around that idea? Uh, you know, is, it's it, a, is it exhortation? Is it, is it um, everybody kind of seeing the light over time? I, I think, you know, it's the, one of the paradoxes of democracy, I guess, if that's not too grand a thought, is that it's very hard for these dead ideas to get exploded honestly in political campaigns. Mm. And it took me a long yeah, time. Yeah. It took me a long time. When I was a younger man, I used to really believe there should be a connection between what campaigning sounded like and what governing sounded like. And I now feel that that was you know, sort of my naive, youthful view. 